will at this point use an exercise. So at this point, here's an exercise that um, I'll hope, uh, I hope you'll all think through. And that's just a picture for a lot of people. So, supposing you're talking about uh, the topic of domestic violence and abuse, just as I mentioned um, a little earlier on in this video. So what are the different ways of knowing about these phenomena, whether it's domestic violence, abuse, intimate partner violence, whatever it is you're looking at there in relation to violence from one person to another. So what are the different ways of knowing about it? Well, the different ways of knowing could be through the victim's eyes, so the lens. Are you looking at it from the victim's point of view? Are you looking at it from the perpetrator's point of view? Or the onlookers? And as I mentioned earlier, they could be onlookers in different ways. It could be family, friends, or neighbours. You know, how, how often have we heard of people saying, oh gosh, the couple next door, I often hear them shouting, and I'm sure there's a bit of violence going on there. But does anybody ever phone 999? Does anybody ever report this? So how far will violence go on before somebody's prepared to intervene? Or supposing it's children in a household, and supposing it's male against female domestic violence, and the children are seeing this happening, then what images of gender does this give to the children? Does it give images that, well, men are strong because they hit women? or women are weak because they don't stand up to the men that are hitting them. All these notions, strength, weakness, um, uh, the, the, the gender stereotypes going on. So it could be that a little boy growing up in a family might think, well, if that's the way men are meant to behave, I better do that when I get a, a, a partner then. And is there a difference between um, different gender, domestic violence and abuse, or same sex? domestic violence and abuse. And look how the way that sometimes so many of these phenomena are just completely underreported. And look at the way in which some people may make excuses about it. So supposing uh, you're working in an accident and emergency department, and maybe you've got the same person coming in on a number of occasions, and this person being beaten up at home yet again. And in your inside in your guts you're thinking why the hell doesn't this person just get up and leave them so why don't they leave them well it could be for a million and one reasons including if i leave my partner they'll find me and they will kill me okay so it's exploring the meanings uh, behind all of this then what are the best ways of studying this? Well, if you're going to use a quantitative method, you're just going to be counting the number of cases. So from that example I just gave about an A&E department, it may be you're going to say, well, I work in A&E and I want to look back on the notes to see how many people come in who have been the victims of domestic violence and abuse. But what happens if a person comes in and says, oh, no, I wasn't hit, I fell down the stairs or I bumped into the door? How is that going to be recorded in, in the notes? So if you're doing a, um, an evaluation, you're doing a look back on notes, how many people are you going to find, how many notes are you going to find of people who identify as being victims of domestic violence if they're making these excuses and giving it different labels? So labeling is another important topic to look at. And what different sources of knowing about the phenomena can be achieved by different ways of exploring them? Well, it may be from people's real lived stories or stuff you read in newspapers or television or the news. So there are different ways of gathering data about this. But look, if domestic violence and abuse ever gets on the national news, then usually it's because somebody has just been killed by someone who has been beating them up for the last 10 years, okay? It's the extreme end of it. It's the, the outcomes that you will hear of, or maybe a research study has just been published and is gonna give you the findings of it, but that none of that is giving you any of the earlier stuff. So how might you find out about the earlier? Another example from a more clinical perspective is to do with the uh, United Nations, unaids.org, uh, looking at trying to get 90% um, of people at least, 
90% of people living with HIV tested so that 90% of those can be started on medication immediately. And then 90% of those can achieve undetectable viral loads of HIV. And if that happens, it means not only does it cease being a life-threatening illness for an individual and becomes a chronic um, illness, someone can live, uh, live with and manage their HIV for the rest of their lives, and they'll live as long as they ever would have lived um, by using this medication to keep the viral load undetectable. But there's also something called TASP, T-A-S-P, and what that means is treatment as prevention. So the very fact that 90% of people um, identified with HIV are taking the medication and then become uh, virally suppressed means it's impossible for them to pass it on. Um, this is called undetectable equals uninfectious. So these are the great goals of UNAIDS. In 2018, they added another 90, which is to reduce HIV stigma by at least 90%. OK, so you might say, well, the particular project, the research you want to do is to explore the impact of stigma about a particular condition. Um, what's the, the role of stigma in preventing people accessing healthcare services? So if you were looking at this from the point of view of HIV, you might say, what's the impact of stigma around HIV? And that's going to be culturally different for all, the, all various people. So whether it's people from different cultures, ethnicities, languages, uh, whether English is their first language or not, how do people in the UK perceive HIV and what impact does stigma have in preventing them in the first place, even going for HIV testing? Okay. So supposing you're looking at people who are referred to as late presenters, someone who goes, um, who's taken into hospital seriously ill and they're diagnosed with an AIDS defining illness and they didn't even realize they'd been living with HIV because they'd never ever been tested. So why had they not been tested? What was the impact of stigma on many of them preventing them going for testing in the first place? OK, so whatever it is you're looking at, you want to explore this in depth as well as in breadth. So uh, don't worry that the evidence isn't complete here, because as you're doing your studies, especially doing master's studies, it may be something that you think, well, I want to do this just to explore the terrain, to see exactly what's going on. Because if I do want to carry on and do this more for doctoral studies, I need to know whether I'm on the right track here. So it could be that you're doing this particular study as an exploration. And then towards the end of your dissertation, you might even just put a box, a table in there about the limitations of this study. Saying, well, look, I went this far, but I know I need to go that far. So show the things that you haven't been able to achieve within this particular study. And that then is sowing the seed ground for you to go on and do further studies at a later time. Thank you.